Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Twitter space this evening. It's our April Twitter space, and we're going to be talking about some of the um, different symptoms that people might present with when they, when they have dementia. So I'm delighted to be joined by um, some speakers this evening, and I'm going to invite them up to um, quickly say hello so I can check their mics are working. Then I'll tell you a little bit about um, what we're going to talk about this evening and also how the space will work. So I'm Vic Lyons. I'm fantastic to, to meet you all. Thank you for joining us. Tracy, um, do you want to start by unmuting and saying hello, please, just so we can know that you can talk? <laughs> hello, everyone. Can you hear me we all right? We can hear you perfectly, Tracy. Thank you. That's that's relief number one out of the way. Um, so thank you. Thank you for joining us, Tracy. Do you want to do a very quick who you are before we check Jules out as well? Okay, yeah, my name is Tracy Shorthouse and I'm a retired nurse Perfect. and I have been having had, had dementia for eight years. Lovely. Thank you so much, Tracy, and we're delighted that you can join us. Um, so, Jules, are you able to speak and say hello? I hope so. Is that is that relief number two? Relief <laughs> number two, I can hear you. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> Hi, evening Vic. Hi, Tracy. I'm Jules Knight. I'm the consultant Admiral nurse for Young Onset Dementia, working for Dementia UK. Very nice to be here this evening. Fantastic. Well, thank you both. I can now relax because you can speak and that's all I need to make this evening work. So, as I said at the very start, today we're going to be talking about some of the different symptoms of dementia. And when we think about dementia, we often think about the kind of really recognisable symptoms that, that people associate with dementia. And, it, and it, predominantly that's, that's memory problems. So it's people um, perhaps forgetting conversations, get, being repetitive, um, not potentially remembering future plans, um, being able to sequence future plans and where they're going and what they're doing it might be people getting lost in places that are familiar to them um, perhaps being unsure of the time the day the date um, you know the, the month and of course it can also be forgetting names and places of people as well so we know these are some of the common symptoms that people think about and I, I think if you went and asked people on the streets, um, in society, what do they think about when they think about dementia? They they probably come up with something that that looks a little bit like that list. However, we know that this, this isn't the only way that people present. And, and for many, many people, they, these aren't actually the first signs and symptoms that they might see. And if you're a younger person and you start to experience dementia, some of those symptoms might be, be very different again. Um, so that's, that's what we want to talk about this evening with you, because I think it's, it's really important to do so. Um, I'm going to start off with you, Jules, and ask you some questions, please. So can you tell us a little bit about what what is your onset dementia? Yep, certainly, Vic. Um, essentially, young onset dementia um, is where people develop symptoms, dementia symptoms under the age of 65. So that's kind of the cutoff. So it's where they develop the symptoms under the age of 65. They may not get diagnosed till much later, but it's really important to look at when the symptoms start. So it's as, as I say, essentially when you have symptoms under the age of 65, you would have what's called a young onset dementia. We know in the UK, in terms of thinking about figures, that there's around 70,800 people living with young onset dementia. So, that you know, and those numbers may be an underestimate. We, we, we struggle to get accurate figures, to be honest with you. And I, susp I suppose actually what we I know that it takes longer for people to to get a diagnosis as well, doesn't it? So when yeah, you talk about yeah. the numbers. Yeah, um, it, from the research that we have, it often takes younger people twice as long to get a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. um, many reasons for that. Do, do you want me to go into yes, that please. a little bit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so essentially because the symptoms tend to be quite different to what older people experience it's often not recognized so you might go to your gp with some concerns that you have and some symptoms that you're experiencing and we'll, we'll, we'll i'm sure we're going to discuss the symptoms um a little bit later on but those symptoms won't necessarily be recognized by the gp or members of primary care because as you say 
they're looking out for things like memory problems, as you mentioned, the memory issues that you mentioned at the start. So it can often be missed. And we, as I say, we know that people can wait twice as long. Um, it's common or average to wait four years for a diagnosis. And actually, people also see about up to, well, five specialists on their, on their route to getting a diagnosis as well. So it can be quite difficult for people. It can feel quite fractured in terms of how they get a diagnosis. Um, and yeah, just, just really, really challenging, essentially. Yeah, and I guess one of the things that, for people who don't know who are in the space, one of the things that I lead on at Dementia UK is our, our work that we're doing to support people living with a diagnosis who are working. And and actually, for many of these people, if we think in reality they're under 65, there's a good chance that, that some of them may well still be actually working when they start to experience um, some of these symptoms. And Tracy, I know we'll hear from you a bit later on about your experience and, and when you got your diagnosis but actually we, we know don't we that people are likely yeah. to be still in work when they yeah to yeah these things. I think you, you hit the nail on the head there Vic I think it's really common um certainly for people and families that I work with for them to say to me actually my work colleagues were the first people to notice the issues and you know they they picked me up on things that I I was doing at work and changes to to how I was functioning at work so you know, often it is work colleagues and mm -hmm. you find that certainly within the work environment, um, you know, your manager might intervene. They might notice these changes yeah. and draw attention to them perhaps for the first time and make you aware of them. Yeah. And that can certainly help a person get on a pathway to getting a diagnosis because it puts, I guess, the seed in their head that actually perhaps this is, is an issue. Mm -hmm. Maybe I need to talk about it with family maybe it's going to be explored more at work hopefully in a supportive way yeah and a positive yeah. way we, we would hope that that would happen mm -hmm. but it's again it goes back to um to really making sure that healthcare professionals but also general public have a really good understanding of the different kind of symptoms that people can experience and being really open to kind of exploring those and understanding them in the context of dementia as well so in terms of healthcare professionals, um, and I know you're, you're not going to want to potentially say too much about this, maybe, but what do, do healthcare professionals in general, do you think, have a good understanding of young onset dementia and the impact and presentation at those early stages? Um, in, in a nutshell, and, be, and, and being very generalistic here, I would say no, it's not mm. always picked up. Um, some, again, some families that I've worked with, they've, you know, their symptoms have been picked up really, really quickly. They've been referred to neurology. Um, they've had all, kind of all the kind of pre-tests relating to, to that. So all the kind of dementia screens that you would expect an older person to have to rule out treatable conditions. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, it's not always on a primary care worker's radar, GP, mm -hmm. um, practice nurse's radar to think about these things because it is relatively rare. Mm -hmm. But actually, it is something that we should all be aware of I would say so it's really mm -hmm. important that we have sessions like this to kind of highlight what those different symptoms know. are because you can imagine can't you that people would think oh it's stress it's pressure mm -hmm. it's you know it's something else certainly if you're a lady it's maybe menopause you absolutely you sort of things can't yeah you? and it's really yeah. important that the GP thinks about all of these things um mm -hmm. you know and actually you get treatment for them so if you are a woman in your 40s 50s actually late 30s even earlier sometimes it could well be um, perimenopausal menopausal mm -hmm. symptoms and actually you know it's really important that we do get the right kind of treatment for that and support with that mm -hmm. but actually always bearing in mind that if you know if you've kind of covered all avenues perhaps dementia is something that you do need to think about and mm. you do need to start having those conversations with your patient or for you as a person if you're really concerned that actually do you know it, I don't think it is perimenopause the, these symptoms that I'm experiencing mm. don't seem to kind of fit that picture then it's really important to go back to the GP and just you know state your case and be quite purposeful about it mm -hmm. and indeed if you know if you're supporting somebody um perhaps as a husband or wife son or daughter you, you know again going back to the gp and supporting them with getting yeah. perhaps the tests that they need 
So thank, thank you, Jules, for all that information. Can I can I ask you to tell us a little bit about some of the the symptoms that somebody might notice? Then the changes, the and I know these symptoms are going to differ from person to person, mm-hmm. on, and on all sorts of you know depending on which area of your brain is affected, um, you know all all, how, all your coping mechanisms that you have in place, your all sorts of things. But yeah. can you talk in a general way about some of the, the symptoms people might notice? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um... I'll go, I'll go kind of through a list if you like to start with, but people in, t- in terms of thinking about different symptoms can experience changes in their behaviour and their personality, um, their language and their communication skills, their social skills, so, you know, how we interact with others, our life skills, how we get on kind of on a day-to-day basis with other people, also experiencing changes to their movement, so potentially their gait, how they're walking, et cetera. And changes to um, vision and um, visuospatial awareness, which I think Tracy's going to talk about a little bit later. So that's kind of the broad areas that we we, we would be thinking about. Um, I can go into these in a little bit more detail, but would you, would you like me to cover perhaps um, behaviour and personality? That might be a really good place to start. Is Vic there? I think she may have dropped out. Well, what I will do then. No, no, I'm here. Please do. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> yeah, please, please do, Jules. I was trying to, I was trying to multitask and failed. So. Oh, okay. No, that's fine. <laughs> at least, at least you're still there. I'm still um, here. <laughs> okay. So what, what I'll do then is I'll, I'll talk through um, behaviour and personality. Um, it, we tend to see these kind of changes, behaviour and personality changes, in people who perhaps have damage to the frontal and temporal parts of the brain, so often in frontotemporal dementia. And in terms of explaining where that is in your brain, essentially it's the area above your eyebrows. So if you get your palms of your hand and rest them above your eyebrows so that your fingers are, are crossed over each other, it's kind of that area across the forehead going down to your ears if you like I think that's probably the best way to describe it without you actually seeing what I'm doing I was just doing the actions for that actually so in terms of symptoms what we can see is um, emotional changes in people so you'd be thinking about reduced empathy and emotional engagement so um, the person um, wouldn't necessarily be able to express their emotions or perhaps read the emotions of somebody else so they can often be described um, as coming across as being quite cold and unemotional the person may also have a lack of awareness into the changes in their behavior and emotion that they're experiencing they really might not have any understanding of these changes they're experiencing they can have changes in their mood so they might become more irritable or more anxious for no apparent reason, flying off the handle, for example, really out of character. Sometimes they may become depressed. They might become withdrawn. They might become more isolated, for example, from family and social occasions. And again, it would be something that's out of character, Um, maybe more suspicious um, of people's intentions or more paranoid. Um, And again, it would be something that's out of character. In terms of personality changes, you'd be looking at things actually like them making decisions about situations that, again, would be hugely out of character. They might spend um, a thousand pound on a designer dress, for example, where, you know, that wouldn't, you know, it would never have happened before. It wouldn't be something in their remit. They may have credit card debts, that kind of thing. They might become secretive unable to account for themselves and where they've been um, developing as I say new habits again that are out of character so potentially things like gambling um, it may be um, I don't know something weird like bird watching that they've never done before so it's it's actually things that are completely out of character and they can come be quite obsessive with it as well there might also be changes in their sense of humor they might become um, their sense of humor might become quite dry Um, And again, very out of character to what they usually like. And if we think about behaviour and kind of looking at somebody's behaviour, they might become more apathetic um, and or lack energy. So again, you'd see them not wanting to engage in social occasions, not not wanting to do the kind of normal hobbies and activities that they really enjoy, kind of almost shutting down, shutting down really. Um, I mentioned earlier they might become more obsessive or more compulsive or more impulsive in their types of behaviour 
again, that's that's quite out of character. Um, we can also see changes in libido, so kind of sexual behaviour. Um, people can become very um, sexually active um, or more sexually active with their partners, more demanding. They might use inappropriate language. Sometimes it can go the other way and, and become less interested, less sexually active. Um, and, and again, going back to being more kind of cold towards their family members. Again, um, people can become verbally and physically aggressive towards partners. And obviously, um, when you're thinking about physical aggression, it, you're thinking about safety. And it is really important to get support. We've got lots of information on our website about that. But it can be really challenging, particularly if you're struggling to get a diagnosis um, and support around all of these changes. Another thing that you can see as well is changes in kind of people's routines and their uh, potentially their personal hygiene. So they can be quite different. And it's really hard, actually, when you're trying to kind of put all of these changes and you wouldn't necessarily have all of these changes, by the way. It might be um, a handful. But when you're actually trying to articulate this to um, a GP, it can be really challenging trying to get across what's actually happened to the person, yeah. um, you know, what these changes are. But what I would say is if you do see these changes, it's really important to perhaps keep a diary, keep notes of the changes that you're seeing, um, speak to friends, mm -hmm. speak to other family members. It, as I said earlier, it might be about speaking to work colleagues. Have they noticed changes? And then obviously trying to get an appointment with, with the GP, having those conversations about this is what's going on. If the person with dementia is not willing to engage in those conversations, as I say, they might not have an awareness, then it might be about having a conversation with the GP without them being there in the first instance. So you can really good, give a good picture of what's going on to the GP so that you can actually then hopefully begin to access the support you need yeah. for yourself and your family as well. And you can talk listening to you talking through the list um, of, of potential symptoms that you might see and, and explaining some of them was fascinating but um, you can imagine actually for somebody themselves experiencing some of these symptoms and how you know articulating them to the GP getting them to, to sort of see and understand and even understanding yourself that these could potentially be the, the start of a dementia it's it, it's very different to what we, we've said at the start of the talk isn't it about what people t typically think about it's yeah yeah you can yeah. see why the GP would say oh you know you're going through a midlife crisis yeah. with some of these types of behavior yeah um, and certainly I've known people be referred for marriage guidance counseling and other things yeah. because you can see why you, you can see why uh, you know somebody making an assessment with 10 minutes to, to talk to somebody might think oh I think it could be depression and it could be something else you know or, or, or something like marriage guidance counseling that's needed <laughs> you, you can yeah, really see why yeah. Can't. and it is really important that we you know the GP rules things out so mm -hmm. that they do have those conversations about depression they do actually look at physical health as well to kind of rule out any physical health care problems. It's really important that those conversations are had and, you know, any kind of treatable condition is ruled out, including things like depression and other mental health issues. Mm -hmm. But actually they then need to go back to thinking, well, if nothing's changed, everything else is in order, perhaps we need to think about is there something neurological going on? Do we need mm -hmm. to think about dementia and having those conversations? I think what I'd like to do, Jules, is come back to you in a mm, little bit. Of course. I'd like to find out from you some of the stuff like what should you do if you if you are worried about these symptoms? What should you? And I know you started touching on it a little bit mm. about going to the GP, but actually, especially if I'm thinking about the fact it might take four years to get that diagnosis, it'd be really helpful. What supports available? What can you do? So if mm -hmm. we, I'd like to come back to you on that in a little bit, but I'm itching to hear from you, Tracy. Um, so <laughs> and, and find out a little bit about you and and your story and 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 actually what you know hearing Jules talking just now um what, what did you first notice Tracy yourself what, what what were you working when you first noticed anything I'm sorry I've asked you two questions there but, but, <laughs> what, yeah yeah I was oh, yeah I was working um on the on this I was a district nurse and I was working um yeah I was working um I remember um when I was about 44 I, had, I started to have um my speech started going. Mm -hmm. 
and um are you okay yeah sorry i couldn't i know um, it's difficult lost... <laughs> it's right. um i lost my train so i just yeah. the train stop um it's like because the, the the screen's gone oh. black and i can't can't see now but it's all right um yeah, so I started, um, my speech started going mm-hmm. slurred and I started getting wobbly on my pins. Mm-hmm. So I couldn't hold my balance very well. And where, where were you working at this point, Tracy? Um, on the community. So you were a nurse working in the community. Oh, yeah, I was a nurse in the community. And, um, yeah. Uh, I was going to say, did you know much about dementia? Were you working in, in that kind of field or in a totally different sort of field? Well, we, well, on on on, dist- on the dist- on the district nursing, we used to deal with everything. So we had to, we had dealt with um probably end stage mm-hmm. of dementia. And in my in my career, I've always looked after end stage commu- um dementia. So I didn't really know anything about young onset because even in my family, it was always my grandparents who had it. So I, I mean, I remember, I think probably in my twenties, I looked after a woman in her thirties who had dementia, mm-hmm. but that's quite a rarity. Yeah, but- so mm-hmm. you know, especially for the nineties yeah. as well. So um, I had I didn't even know that I think I had dementia. Mm-hmm. I uh, I thought I had something else. I thought I had MS yeah. because I like a bad nurse. I googled my symptoms <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and it came up came up with mm-hmm. that. Um, and then my doctor thought I had a brain tumor, mm-hmm. and then when I went to hospital, so I was, I was taken to hospital. They thought I had a stroke. Um, because I was having all sorts of different um, problems, um, I couldn't remember anything. Mm-hmm. And then I was in hospital for about a week, and then um, the neurologist told me there was nothing wrong with me. It was either stress or depression. I was to go back to work and carry on my life, and that was it. Mm-hmm. Really. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it, I laugh about it now, but at the time it was very frustrating. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause I, so I went back to work, and um, I remember. We had a new patient on. We had to do with the peg feed, and I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember from going on Monday to the Friday what I was supposed mm-hmm. to be doing. And then my my friend said to me, a friend and colleague said to me, "Oh, I think you um, you said wrong your brain." Right. So, um, and I said, "Well, I've been trying to tell people, but nobody's believing me." Um, so I went to see my boss. She said, "I'll um try to get referred to the memory clinic." Mm-hmm. So um, um, I tried to get, go, I went to my GP and he told me that I was wasting his time. There was nothing wrong with me and that I was just going to carry on doing my work. And I, I thought I can't keep going back to work because I can't remember. Mm-hmm. And luckily I went to another doctor who referred me to the memory clinic and then it stayed all for me. And that's, you know, it's, it's terrible really isn't it that experience because when you you know you you're you're going to speak speak to your gp to seek some guidance some support and, and actually kind of just been sent go back to work and it, so that sounds like that was really really hard to, to get that diagnosis and to get that gp to really listen and sort of see what was going on and it, it, that must have felt really frustrating and really difficult for you as well it was what it was. I think it was worse. I think it was the worst because I work at the same time. I couldn't remember. I mean, by this time the, the symptoms got worse, so um, I was having struggling. Mm. Like um, I went to write a pa- I went. I wrote a patient's notes, and then my colleague went in after me. And she, said, what the hell were you writing? Yeah. It's all gobbledygook. <laughs> and then, yeah. I mean, I laughed about it now, but at the time I, I didn't know what she meant. So when I went back after her or she bought the notes out mm-hmm. i think and i looked at the notes and it was um it was all gobbledygook mm-hmm. it, it was nothing it was nothing made that none of those notes made sense yeah. at all the date was yeah. like 2048 and i had no clue what i was meant to be writing or t- i just couldn't remember mm-hmm. um all the connect my coordination was, was really bad i couldn't remember how to write numbers and all the time i was trying to get um go through trying to get a diagnosis i was trying to work yeah. at the same time and it was really really just really yeah. hard it was most stressful I can honestly say it was the most stressful time of my life mm-hmm. because my my colleagues didn't really understand either and did you have um I, I know you've got a family so what what was your family situation like at that time well I live alone oh, so I live 
yeah, I live, um, I've been on my own for a very long time. So, um, yeah, so I, I even went to get my diagnosis, I went on my own because I went on my own because I was frightened mm -hmm. of the consultant talking to whoever I took with me rather than me because I heard, I've seen that so many times yes. with nursing. Yeah, yeah. And the last thing I really wanted to be was being spoke over and not being seen as a person because that's the most important thing. Do Really? So you were actually going through it on your own as well then? So there wasn't anybody in your family around uh, to help or support with this? or no, I, t I, I, I just felt like, well, I just, I'm quite, I'm, I never like to lean on anybody. Yeah. So they I have to, I feel like I have to do things on yep. my own. Um, and I did, I have did tell my family, mm -hmm. and I can't remember how I told them now, but I usually, any, anything bad, <laughs> you know, like we're called bad news, I usually do it face to face because it's easier than over yeah. the phone because it's easier to do it face to face. And I like to gauge how they yeah. are. And um, my my mum's reaction was, "Oh, you're gonna have to come and live with me now because you've got dementia. You can't live on your own. People with dementia can't live on their own." <laughs> and, I, and I've got eight years later, I've proved them yeah. wrong because I'm still independent, still out there fighting the good yeah. fight, still able to do things yeah absolutely and I think lots of people think that actually don't they that you know that that tendency yeah. to want to wrap somebody up in cotton wool once they've received that diagnosis but you know and, and I think that's a normal part when you, you live and care for somebody but actually it can be quite disabling can't it because you need to you need to very go much. on and do your own things and uh, yeah very much so yeah so you eventually um received your diagnosis and at uh, that point do you remember if you were given any supports around around sort of adjusting and coping and and actually how did you make some of these decisions that you know to say to mum actually no I don't need to move in with you I'm just really interested to know did it, what support looked like for you at that time well I was lucky because um my consultant who I like very much because he's I've always gone to him on my own I see him on my own and he doesn't read better than I live now. It was in the beginning, he said, oh, you haven't got anybody with you. I said, no, I live on my own. So there's nobody, no, although I, my family and family, my fa friends and family are quite close, nobody sees the day-to-day -day life of how living with my de dementia is. So why would I go to see a consultant with somebody who doesn't know what my dementia is like, really, from a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah. Um, but he's actually um, organised for me to have a, health professional come and see me every two to three weeks it's always been that way since my diagnosis so for eight years I was I have something to offload mm -hmm. to so if I have a because I get quite a lot of anxiety and depression with my dementia mm -hmm. um and um so he so I need to talk it out so I can't really talk it out to my friends and family I don't like mm -hmm. to so I talk it out to the health professional, which helps That's me. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. and, the, and they, they come out to see you. And I know that you're actually really active on your day-to-day -day life, aren't you? Because you were when we were talking in, in preparation for, for, for this conversation, you were, you were telling me all sorts of things that that you're involved in. Could, would you be able to tell us yeah. some of the stuff that, you know, what does your day-to-day -day life look like now and what, what are you still involved in? Um, well, I get involved with the... Um, KMPT, which is the Kent Midway Partnership Trust, mm -hmm. which is like a mental health trust. I do a lot of work with them. Um, I, one of my groups is a deep group, but is also part of the KMPT. Mm -hmm. So and we do a lot with an activist group. Um, and there's two of us with PCA, so that's quite handy because we both it affects us in both different ways. So with our vision problem, we get asked to look at buildings and like just recently I've been involved with the local waitrose mm -hmm. going around to make sure it's all like dementia friendly and make sure that the, their, their signage is good their colour scheme is better is good because I can't deal with um I can't deal with bold colours not pastel mm -hmm. colours I can't see if I have any patterns anywhere I can't cope with patterns anywhere because it makes me fall nice. over um and um, things like that, really. So we, we do get a lot involved in lots of things. And I think I've been involved in recently um, a new hospital in um, Maystone. We've been involved in the build of that, making sure that it's, um, there's enough spaces everywhere and 
nothing's too closed off in the colour scheme for that hospital as well. Mm. It's, it's, it's important to get involved in these yeah. things. It, it's, it, and I guess actually for you, as for, um, for everybody it's important, but when you've been a nurse as well, you, I, you, I can imagine, certainly in terms of the hospital design, that that's something that you're going to have lots of skills and knowledge that you can bring as well into that space because of your, your nursing background. So I can imagine that that's tremendously helpful for, for the hospital and great that you're involved in in doing these things as well. It must feel very, it, it must feel very rewarding actually to, you know, to, to kind of know that it, the advice you've given helps so many other people as well. So that's fantastic that you're doing that. That's uh... well, I, I like to think that um... Oh, yeah, when I first gave up nursing, when I first retired as a nurse, I just did not know what to do with my life, myself, mm-hmm. really. And then I thought, that, and now I look back, I think I'm doing, I still help yeah. others, but in different yeah. way. Um, I, do, I do teaching now, so I sort of um, help with advanced dementia training for the KMPT, and I have done that with um, some Canadian students as well in the past, mm-hmm. which has been quite nice because it just, you know, it just I'm giving back again, like giving always giving back, which is how we should be doing with our dementia. Anybody with dementia should be helping others. Yeah. And that, that's Can, you're you're completely right. Can I ask you to talk a little bit more, please, Tracy, about because um, you mentioned about um, you know sort of patterns and some of those those symptoms that you've you've experienced as well in your vision and 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 I know you've you mentioned to me before about steps and you know going up and down steps. Can I yeah. can you tell us a little bit more about some of these these kind of unusual symptoms can, and challenges? I can go up the stairs no problem. I can go up any stairs, but then coming back down. Um, like for at, at home, I have to do it by feel. I can't. I sit, I feel for the back of my back of the the back of the yeah. step with the back of my leg, and that's how I do it. Or and I have two banisters now, whereas before I only had, had one banister, and I, then I had to going upstairs sometimes when I'm tired was going back even up on my bottom or coming down my bottom, which is really isn't very mm. safe. So my um, my health professional got some equipment in the house for me. Like for, I can get in the bath, but I can't get out the bath because I can't remember how to get out of the mm. bath. And I found I was stuck in the bath for quite a while without and getting panicky because I couldn't remember how to get out of the bath. So I've got a bath cushion, a bath board, and some grab rails and all sorts of things because I tend to fall out of balance mm. problems. Um, and if I it's kind of, if I'm coming down the stairs on the, in a strange building or somewhere that I'm not sure about, I come down sideways because I can't tell the difference of I can't see the depth mm-hmm. of the stair. I don't know how I can't see that at all. So it's like coming down the curb of a pavement. I can't see. So I go down sideways. So because I just can't see. It's, it's bizarre yeah. really. Um and does that is that quite hard then uh, I mean I, I'm trying to imagine and thinking about areas and places I've been today and sort of thinking you know when you're getting out and about do you find that quite a challenge then at times or do you, do you mostly uh, sort of program yourself to how to deal with them because it sounds like you've got some great strategies that you use to, to try and prevent any risks to yourself but it's I think it's that uh, I've been I've had I've been I've been had dementia for eight years so I, I just yeah. adapt I, I think the key, the key word is yeah. adapt yeah. all the time. I mean, I, I get panicky leaving the house, but I do it because I need mm-hmm. to. I need to get out. I need to. I need to go for walks. I need to. I, I mean, I'm not very really good at using public transport, so I, when I go on the train or the bus, I have to go near the on the on the bus. I have to go near where the button mm-hmm. is, so I can. So I, I get panicky otherwise, and um, sometimes the buses don't always put their their the the step down. Mm-hmm. And that, that's hard for me because I can't go. I can't gauge where how how steep this pavement is to step to get in on the bus. Mm-hmm. So I have to keep asking them to put the seat that the um, step down because I can't I can't gather it out. Those sort of things are problematic, mm-hmm. really. Um, words get muddled sometimes. I can't and I and I, ha- I have something called what I call hallucination backwards, which is a bizarre thing because it's like when well, I want to want something and I'm looking for something but I can't find it because even though it's in front of me it might be on the table um, mm-hmm. but it's, my brain hides right. it yeah. so and like, 
So it could be a pair of scissors, it could be my umbrella, it could be a pen. And then when I'm not looking for it, I think, oh, mm-hmm. it's right there mm-hmm. in front of me. And I've had people say to me, it's there. Can't you not yeah. see it? And I said, no, I can't see yeah. it. And that's because the brain's hiding it. That's, that's really interesting. It's a great way of explaining it, actually, because it, it, you instantly get what you're talking about when you when you say that. And it, it does make sense. So so I guess, you know, you, 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 it sounds like you've, you've and you've got some great skills in adapting and and developing and and do you think you've you've always had those is that what you were like as a person anyway do you think or do you think you've you know you've kind of had to learn those skills as well I think I've had to learn the skills but I think when you're a nurse you have to adapt to situations all the time so when you're a staff nurse I was I used to work it was a staff nurse before I was out in district and I you have to adapt all the time because no no situation is the Mm -hmm. same is it so and that's when when you're a nurse that's how it is so I think as a person I'm quite good at problem solving and 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 adapting to how you know it in the beginning it was quite frustrating like I remember I don't always recognize people Mm -hmm. now so if I haven't seen somebody for a long time and they're in the course not being horrible but women tend to change their appearance quite quickly (laughs) whereas men don't um but um i remember i remember bumping to a friend in t- in um in, in town and i didn't even recognize her she's and then she had changed her hair <laughs> and her glasses i didn't even know who she was she, and it was only until she started speaking to me that i realized who she yeah. was I mean, but the next time i saw her i recognized her but she didn't speak to me because she said to me what was the point of speaking to me when she did, i didn't recognize her <laughs> And those, and those sort of things frustrate yeah. me because, you know, I'd rather people say hello to me, even though I don't recognise yeah. them, because I'll, eventually the memory will come back mm-hmm. again and I'll think, oh, yeah, I know who you are. It's just it's just those sort of things which, are, which gets, I get frustrated yeah. about, really. Uh, it, it completely makes sense. And I, and, and I know what, you, what you're talking about in terms of, you know, people changing their appearances or even sometimes I think people being in a place you don't expect them to be for many people I struggle with that anyway if I bump into somebody in a place I don't expect them to be my brain is sort of goes oh you're here (laughs) and and I don't always recognize them in in the wrong place and and that's something I've had all all my life actually so I completely get what you, you know you're talking about with that as well and how hard it can be when someone just looks a bit different or they're not in the right spot or where you think they should be yeah yeah I get I get hallucinations well not so much now but in the beginning I used to get hallucinations quite a lot when I got mm-hmm. tired which I which you, and, and it's very hard when you have these hallucinations like I got I used to get an, another friend of mine who has PCA she has the same mm-hmm. thing you have like um thousands of spiders all over the bedroom all over the walls mm-hmm. and you know it's not you know it's not there because no there's no way and <laughs> it's a horror film <laughs> there's no way there could be um thousands of spiders everywhere but um it's just it's just really hard because you have, I, it, it, I put all the lights on I think well it's not there really it's become mm-hmm. tired but now because I tend as soon as I get tired I get I tend to go to bed as soon as I get tired so I put I put you know you put things in place to stop that from yeah. happening and that can be really really difficult as well because like you say you know that the hallucination it's a hallucination you know it's not there but actually they can mm-hmm. feel incredibly real can't they at that you know and, and actually yeah. sort of convincing yourself that it's it's not there can be can be really difficult um i'm just going to to do quickly say to anybody if you've got any questions if you do want to ask any questions obviously that only works if you're in the live space with us if you're listening to this on a recording later on obviously you you can't do that um you can always email them or or submit them across and we'll we'll try and answer them but if you do have any questions you want to ask if you go down um and and you'll see the little speech bubble at the bottom so feel free to submit any questions that way um can i come back to you jules and then i'm going to come back to you again tracy but can I ask you, Joel? So we, we haven't really covered an awful lot about PCA and what it actually is. So can you tell us a little bit about that? And then I'd like to ask you, Tracy, afterwards, did you know anything about this before? Because I think it'd be really interesting for, for people listening to us to to understand a little bit more about this, this diagnosis and this type of dementia. Oh, Vic, I'm sorry. I'm just about to have a coughing fit. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I just want... <laughs> 
<laughs> Bad timing to come to you. Sorry, if you give me two seconds, I'm just going to take a sip of water. Yes, of course. That's, that's fine. I mean, uh, whilst Jules is just recovering, Jules has been really poorly recently, so I'm glad that she's here and able to talk at all. But Tracy, did you know much about PCA beforehand? No, I didn't. Mm. I didn't know. The first time I had problems was um um because at first my diagnosis was young onset of Alzheimer's mm-hmm. disease, and then I went, went walking in the countryside, mm-hmm. and all the leaves were pink and blue, and yeah, yellow. It was like having a it was a weird sensation that all the colours that I was seeing was all mm-hmm. wrong. Um, and then so I went back to my 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 consultant. I said to him, "I'm having these these weird." sensations i've seen different colors where they sh- where they shouldn't mm-hmm. be and he's like not, not right to see pink leaves on a <laughs> on a tree mm-hmm. um and then uh, he just said oh you've probably got yeah i think you've got pca right. um and you'll probably end up getting a little bit worse mm-hmm. um and then i i didn't know anything about pc i'd never heard of it before so i went on the on google <laughs> good old google <laughs> <Google. laughs> i don't know it's my good yeah. teacher and i you know, was all i could find about um PCA um, and just to learn about it and I thought oh yeah that's me and I thought I read, read, read all the way down them and I thought oh that's me and that's mm. me so yeah so good. yeah that's how I learned about it really. I guess the other thing um, I think Jules has perhaps recovered but I think the other thing to mention is that it's it's kind of sometimes also called Benson syndrome and, and I've heard mm. those two used very interchangeably um, but Jules you're back and you can talk. Yeah, I'm so sorry <laughs> I was just about right. to speak then and I got the biggest tickle in my throat. Oh, that's that's um, doing things live. <laughs> yeah <laughs> sorry. Tracy thank you you explained that really well as it pos- I was going to say PCA stands for posterior cortical atrophy I'm not sure if we we mentioned that previously um but it's essentially where there is damage to the cells the brain cells sort of towards the back of our brain so again I'm kind of going to try and tell you where it is if you if you put your hands on the back of your head um at the top of your neck it's kind of that area physiospatial awareness area and um quite often it's associated I think with Alzheimer's disease um, though I think other dementias um, can also kind of interact and cause sort of PCA as well um, so as, as, as Tracy said you're looking at kind of visio spatial awareness problems um, I think you've you, you know you've described them perfectly Tracy um, sometimes people have um, issues of their perception and their spatial awareness so they may um misreach for objects I think it's interesting Tracy when you were talking about um having the re- reverse of hallucination I think that 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 described it perfectly actually that you actually can't see something um there's difficulty I think with perceiving depth and kind of the volume of things as well mm. so not quite knowing the depth of um like steps Tracy like you were explaining and I think also, you can have difficulties with walking across different coloured floors. So if, for example, there's lines on the floor or patterns on the floor, it can be a real issue for kind of walking across it because the way you perceive it would be quite different to what's actually there. So that you might, for example, if there's a dark area on the floor, think it's a hole and, and you know, yeah. feel the need to step over it in case you fall down the hole, which could then have impact <clears throat> on, on your mobility. Oh, yeah, go for it, Tracy, yeah. Um, yeah, um, yeah we, 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 I went um, somewhere in Margate and um, we went to the cafe and then on the stairs was a black carpet. So we went up the, up the upstairs, okay, and then when we come to come down, I really couldn't come downstairs, me and me and my friends, who were both we both got PCA, and they'd be saying, "Come on, why can't you come down the stairs?" We can't. I said, "We can't." Cause it looked like a slope. It looked like, like a slope on the stairs because it was a black carpet, and luckily the sides were were um, not covered by the carpet. Um, and then we sort of we went on tiptoe sideways down the stairs. <laughs> by the side of the, where the carpet was yeah yeah and no, I can completely believe yeah. that um you know yeah. uh, so much I thought we we would go we go fall it, it just made me more aware not to, not to go up the stairs with this black carpet yeah. on your own. and I can imagine if you're on stairs that are not even as well that you know certainly I live in a really old house so my stairs are, are a bit 
wobbly and a bit they're, they're quite shallow and not very even the top one's much bigger than the bottom one or mm. is there somewhere where the stairs aren't even you know in nature for example i don't know if you like walking or hiking um you know that that's going to be really hard actually isn't it as well tracy yeah it, well in folkestone um, if you go down, the, if you want to go down the side of the cliff, sometimes they have these old, really old stone mm. steps. I have to go down sideways using my stick as a as a help to help because there's no balusters, there's nothing to help you stay on board. If that makes mm-hmm. sense. So, and they all the stones are on the stone steps are uneven. Yeah. Another another thing I have problems with as well. A friend of mine had a new floor put in, which was. Um, black shiny tiles mm. <laughs> so it looked like a um, black hole but but also very wet as well but it wasn't wet at all so I had each time I go there I have to go on tiptoes as if it's my brain keeps telling me it's wet but even though it's yeah. not it's 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 very different isn't it i'm really glad we're, we're having this conversation this evening because potentially there's people listening who who just would never have considered mm. that this this could be a you know a, a symptom or a sign that someone's developing dementia and 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 you know to, to having this conversation is, is is really important i guess um it, it's probably worth mentioning that uh, on the dementia uk website we've got um information we've got resources resources that Jules I know you've been involved in helping and, and Tracy yeah. you have too would you like to tell people a little bit about some of the the stuff that's on our website because it might be that people listening would would like to to to, to get to that so it's the Dementia UK website which is um, dementiauk.org um, but Jules do you want to tell us a little bit more about that yeah I'll also try and put the link up between now and when we finish as well um so yeah we've got we've got some um new information on the website I mean we we try and grow and develop our our young onset information anyway and the most recent work that we that we've kind of put into developing is looking at the different symptoms so we've got a full website page there um, as I say, I, I will I will put the link in for that. But we're looking at what the symptoms are of young onset dementia. Um, it's, uh, looking at some of the changes in personality that we've discussed it discussed. So going through some of those main differences, if you like, that you see in younger people. Um, looking at the differences in language and communication that people might experience changes in movement and coordination they can experience i think we've already touched on the changes that people might experience with like their social skills and life skills and and tracy has already covered you know the changes that people experience with visual perception and spatial awareness so there's lots of information on our website about each of those different um behaviors that you can read more in more in depth and there's also um a section on thinking about the future and also sources of support so if you feel that you need some additional support there is a drop down box there for that um there's also a leaflet that you can download so that that will be really helpful for you to kind of you know have have to hand and store it's got some fantastic information on there always i'd say one of the most important things to to share um, on the Twitter spaces is our Admiral Nurse Helpline details. Um, so our helpline is always there to support you if you're concerned um, about any different behaviours that you might experience, might be experiencing or re- a relative is experiencing. Also on the web page, um, which actually I watched for the first time today because it literally is um, a brand new web page. We've got a film on the different symptoms and it's it's fantastic actually i have to say um it's it's been pulled together really well and it it's well it, it it's basically a mini film um going through the symptoms that a person with um young onset dementia is experiencing and how his friends and family and work colleagues respond to that actually so it's a really really good film and it just highlights some of these different behaviors sorry different symptoms rather that that people experience so i will drop the link in um, but please do go and have a look at the website it's fantastic 
and I, I'm just going to publicly say as well, the film's really good. Um, I, I was really impressed when I watched the film. It gives so much information. So we, we'll, what we'll do is when we share this space afterwards, we, we'll make sure we share a link to those resources that you spoke about as well, Jules, and, and also the film, because if, if you know, it just might be really helpful. I can see that, um, Cal, you've requested the mic. We're not actually giving the mic out at this space, but if you do have a question you want to ask, if you just put the question into the the chat so at the bottom you should see a little um, icon that you can put the a question in and you've, you've got a couple of minutes so quickly send us a question if you want to do that and um, we will we'll come to you and answer that question so um jules i'm going to stay with you and um, mm-hmm. hopefully your voice holds out so in what if somebody is listening to this or if somebody is you know sort of waiting for that diagnosis what 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 kind of supports available for people at that point or what should they be doing can you talk a little bit about that for us quickly in sorry did you say at the point of diagnosis or coming to the point at the point that they're waiting i think initially and then i was going to do the point of diagnosis afterwards you can jump jump together if you want (laughs) it's it's, whichever is easier I, i mean i think it's sort of reflecting back to what we were talking about earlier um in order to get yourself on the right pathway to to getting that diagnosis It's about working with your GP. So if you feel that, you know, all the kind of reversible causes have been covered, it's about going back to your GP and having those conversations to make sure that you get referred on um, to either your local memory service or to your local neurology service. And it's important to check with the GP that they refer you to the right service. So to make sure that they support people Um, with rarer types of dementia and younger onset dementia so probably neurology but it's always worth chatting to the GP about that in terms of being referred to neurology it will take a while for you to get a diagnosis you will undergo a lot of tests there's cognitive tests there may be some scans um, and it may take some time for you to actually get your diagnosis it's because it takes the neurologist quite some time to gather all of the information they need so they'll be as I say looking at scans looking at cognitive testing looking at your life history and the symptoms that you're experiencing and then hopefully they can share the outcome of that diagnosis with you Um, In terms of how you're supported, we ideally would like, obviously, once you have that diagnosis, for you to be given information on the type of dementia that you have and how you can support yourself and look after yourself and also think about your future. Um, And that kind of then ties in with um, post-diagnostic support. Do you want me to to talk a little bit more about that? I didn't know if you wanted to ask another question, Vic. Sorry, that's why I'm a bit quiet. No, that's absolutely fine. Yes, please. So in terms of thinking about the post-diagnostic support, it can often be quite difficult for somebody who's younger to get that post-diagnostic support, particularly when you're diagnosed in neurology services. They're not set up really to kind of link you in with what's happening in the community. Mm-hmm. So if if you do get a diagnosis and then you're struggling to get that support post-diagnostically, again, I would say give our helpline a call mm-hmm. and they hopefully will be able to help you identify some local support in your area. It might be that they, you know, have a look to see if there's um, dementia cafes that you can go to or whether there is a particular young onset service that you can connect in with. Um, we'd also recommend that um, you try and make connections with other people who are experiencing similar things. So again, it might be contacting local dementia services to see if they can support you mm-hmm. with making those connections. But I would say come come to the helpline, ask for some advice about mm-hmm. how you can make those connections. If you do need some support, so if if like Tracy, perhaps you've got you need some support um, in terms of leading a normal life with your you know visual spatial awareness having been an issue, it might be that you would um, refer yourself to social services to see if they can provide any practical support around keeping you as independent as possible. Rather like Tracy was talking about, it's it's being able to live. Um, the, your life in the best way that you possibly can by accessing all the support that you need but it, as I say it can be a challenge because services aren't the same everywhere we know from area to area they can be quite different so it can be difficult to kind of access services to begin with yeah. um, to find services that support you um, but we can hopefully on the helpline 
support yeah. you in, in in beginning to find that so I think the thing it's probably helpful for me to mention here is obviously you talked about the helpline um, in, in terms of support that we can offer again you'll find that out on the Dementia UK website and if you go to how we can support you get get support and how we can support you they've got different options so obviously you've got the helpline that Jules mm. mentioned you can also book an appointment and obviously if you're working if you're um, you know it might be easier to do that as well so do do look at that feature as well you can you can go onto the website go i'd like to speak to an admiral nurse and actually that date works well for me and and book an appointment and we will contact you back that way and obviously there's all the information that we mentioned earlier online so to do check out those resources um and I, and I guess there's other, obviously there's other organisations and other, other people offering um, resources as well that, that may well be beneficial to you. So I'm going to really start wrapping up because I think we've learned so much this evening. It's been a fantastic um, conversation where, you know, we've really explored some of these, these different types of um, symptoms and, and presentations. But I'd like to come to both of you for a kind of key message. If, if you could say, well, you can, because this is your opportunity and I'm giving you this opportunity. If you wanted to say one thing to people listening in, in terms of our conversation this evening, what would that be? What would your key message that you'd like to share to to our listeners be and i'll start with you tracy if that's okay okay that's fine um i just usually tell people that you can still carry mm. on you can still do things you just need to adapt it's like every day you just have to adapt to whatever situation comes up but you can still do it mm -hmm. i've been i live alone i don't need any help and i still carry on doing the best things yeah. i can and that's the best thing you can do. That's a great key message to, to end with as well. So thank you so much for that, Tracy. And obviously, thank you for, for joining us um, this evening. Jules, a key message? I, th I think it's, you know, if, if somebody's struggling to get heard in terms of what's happening to them and they really feel that, that their friends, their family have recognised that there are issues, Mm -hmm. go back to the GP you know if you've been to the GP and you feel like you haven't been heard go back mm -hmm. and maybe take a friend or family member with you so that you can really articulate what's going on very clearly and you know have a look at the symptoms on our website the different symptoms you know if if you think well, actually that's a match for me go back to the GP and take, explain take that why that's a match well. yeah absolutely Yep, yep. So this is what's this is this this is the issue for me and I need some support. Thank you. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, both of you. You've been amazing speakers, amazing guests. I, I, I hope everybody who's listened live or who listens to the recording later on for the conversation helpful. Um, thank you both for joining me tonight. Um, in next month, we're going to be talking about um, a, a slightly different topic because we're going to be talking about dying uh, with dementia. It's part of the Dying Matters Week. Um, we're going to have this conversation. So obviously, you know, perhaps a, a difficult conversation for, for people, but but you know, one that's very important that we, we, we have nevertheless. So. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, I hope you found it helpful. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you, Jules, for your time this evening. And um, we will shortly be ending the space. So thank you, everybody. Bye.